Okay, we're gonna say welcome. Um, and this is a session on how to implement data journalism and a data team within your newsroom, and we have all some experience in this. My name is Helena Bengtson. I work as the editor for data journalism at uh, the national broadcasting company in Sweden. I've been doing data journalism for almost 20 years now, and uh, been running a couple of teams, one in Washington at the Center for Public Integrity, where I ran the data team for a couple of years, and at The Guardian, where I ran the, the, team for, uh, the data projects team uh, for three years, uh, and I left The Guardian one year, a year and a half ago. And also in Sweden, where we have a very small team of data journalism there. Uh, so that's me. I started initially at The Guardian as a trainee, and I did a stint on the data blog. And uh, I left and spent a couple of years at the Financial Times on the investigation team, and then left to join the Times as a data journalist, and I've been the team's editor for the last year. Speak into this tiny mic. Um, so my name is Keelan Barr, and I'm the data projects editor at The Guardian. Helena and I worked together at The Guardian for three years. Um, so I, yeah, my background is in regular, general journalism, and I really got into data journalism by chance. Um, and a lot of the training I had was also through the CIJ. Um, really working alongside people who were training journalists in data journalism skills was the way I, I really learned. Um, and Cynthia Marco, who's here teaching at the moment, is the first person who taught me Excel. Um, so I run a small team of um, three journalists uh, in a newsroom, uh, it's print and online. And we'll t I guess we'll get to kind of the mechanics of the teams, how they work, um, the pros and cons of being a new team or being seen as being something innovative um, as we go. Well, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about setting up team or introducing a team and, ha and introducing data, the use of data in your newsroom. Uh, and I think I've done both. I've, all, I've come to an existing team in Washington. There was an existing team that was sort of the backbone of that organization, which was very good. They didn't do anything that didn't go through the data team at that point. And, but I've also, both in Sweden and a little bit in England, uh, set up teams. And I think that you have to start of sort of thinking about, because what kind of stories do you want to do? What kind of people do you want to work with? Uh, what kind of people do you need for your team? And one of the crucial things to talk about is, do you want your team to enable reporters and editors to do work, do, you, uh, do great work and implement data into that work so that the, the stories become fuller, more full of context, better, and also sometimes unique in a way that you can't do otherwise. Or do you want a team of writing or producing reporters that do their own data work and then sort of go out and, and report that, what they've found, and then write their own stories? Most teams are a mix of both, I think. I'm, I think I am unique in the way, because I work in television, and television is a little bit different, I think, because television, the reporters there are so focused on, they have so many things that I have to keep, keep track on, that adding a person on and working as a team actually works better. So I'm sort of catered that way, and also I've worked in languages that is not my own, so that has been natural for me to sort of have a person that has journalism degree or a journalism skill to write or do stories in their language, and I've been working in a team. I think that introducing this, it's really important that you have a good conversation with, because this is the, it's still a little bit of a rave. It was a huge rave a couple of years back, but it's still a little bit of a rave, and I have a, a boss very high up who says, data journalism is really important, and I say, how and why? And have those conversations, have the, how do you want? And I think when we started a team, Keelan and I, at The Guardian, the great thing was that our boss at that time, who is also here and speaking later today, uh, he knew what he wanted out of a data team. 
he called, what did he call us? We were supposed to be uh, the aggressive part? Oh, aggressively collaborative. Aggressively collaborative. And that, I think, was a really good way. And I, that actually, ever since then, I've sort of taken that. That means that we should collaborate with the reporters, but we should force them to collaborate with us. If they want a piece of a table handed to them so that they can go off and do their own thing, we're, we're not going to let them do that. We'll have to have a discussion on what is the story. What are you going to do with this data? How will we present this data? What is the, what is the fact box of this story? Or what is the, so. So I think that when having that conversation with your boss on how you will work in the newsroom is really important. One other thing that I've also found is really important is choosing your boss if you're possible, if it's possible. Because a data team will, because the normal cause is still that we, you do some kinds of, usually you do some kinds of collaborations. Uh, the higher up in the hierarchy your boss is, the easier it is to do those collaborations because then you don't have to go through a lot of department heads to be able to work with those departments. If you have a boss higher up in the hierarchy, he can say, OK, you go the work there, you go work there. I'm going to get a person from that department here. If you have a boss in the lower, and this may sound silly, but it actually has a good impact. It's really important that you, that you think about that. And another thing that might sound silly is credit. But it's really important to think through how do you want your team to work, especially if you have a mixed team of developers and, and data journalists. How will they be credited? And have that conversation when you're not on the verge of publishing a big story and you suddenly have a reporter who thinks that additional reporting by is at the end of a story is sufficient for a major analysis that have led to a major breakthrough because the reporter wrote the words, but the facts and the sort of the, the context and everything came from an analysis done by a developer. Or, or a, so I think that and having those, when you set up a team, you shouldn't be afraid to have those conversations. Uh, I have a couple of examples that I just wanted very briefly to show. So one thing that I also think that you should do when you set up a team is choose your, the first stories that you do. So for me, it happened to be, this was actually, I would love to say that I planned this very carefully. It, I didn't, but it made me think of that that's really important. When you're setting up a team, make sure that your first story is something that people can relate to and that actually can make quite a big impact. So. I happened to come across, or actually a colleague of mine happened to come across the land registry database of all the property sales, which is in its full length, I think, 9 million records long or something like that, or even longer now. So we started, I started looking at this, and this is a little, you can see that it's a little dated and it's a little, something has happened to it because it's a couple of years old. But we did this project called Unaffordable Country, where we did a website where you can look at how are the proper, what are the property prices around England and Wales? And also we did a number of stories, which sort of made an impact on our bosses saying that this is what you can do with data journalism. But in some cases, it is very good to have a special reporter, a specialist reporter, like, for instance, Rob Booth. So him and me, we did this story where I, we actually shared a Google sheet on this story, which was quite cool, I was cleaning one part of the Google Sheet that had all the inhabitants of this skyscraper. And he was at the same time doing research on these people, editing in the same Google Sheet. So we could all, we could see our others, each other's work the whole time and work together on this. It became a great story. Uh, and these stories have also been with specialist reporters. I'm, of course, I'm already supporting The Guardian. Uh, everybody should do that. Uh, uh, where we had a reporter in the U.S. who'd done a lot of political campaign data who came to me and said, I want to look into these two contributions, these large contributions. And I said, well, let's look at the whole data set. And we did this story. So I think that finding the reporters that will benefit from your skills. Uh, the education editor and I got off on the wrong foot when we started 
because he wasn't interested in people coming here from foreign countries and trying to teach him anything. And we actually did a number of stories together, and he's now, I consider him one of the gr really good Guardian reporters. And that leads me to the, my, my last point, which actually is when you set up a team, think about doing some training and not to train the reporters really. You can, you can tell them that that's why you're doing the training, that you want to train the reporters in simple Excel skills or something like that. But setting up a team and doing training really enables you as a team to uh, introduce yourself to a lot of reporters so that they can identify you when they have a story. And it also allows you to identify reporters that you can approach because you can see which reporters will be working. So, and that's how we sort of turned around the school. The education editor who came into the class the first, uh, the first hour looking like this in the back of the classroom, sort of. And the second one, and, the sec and in the break, he came up to us, killing me, and said, do you actually know what you're doing? And we said, yeah, we've been doing this for a while. So yes, we do know what we're doing. And he was like, and we did a lot of work after that. So training enables you to introduce yourself and to identify reporters. So I haven't set up a team or, or been part of a unit that's been freshly set up. I've, um, despite always working with data, both at the Guardian and at the Financial Times, the first time I ever had the job title of data journalist was just under two years ago at The Times. And I did notice a change in, you know, some confusion around were we real reporters? Did we do our own writing? So it has been um, an interesting experience to have been in various roles in different newsrooms and see what the perception of data journalism is. Um, my team is quite small at the Times. It's a team of four, although we do have a vacancy um, to go up shortly. Uh, but between two teams, which is our data journalism team and our interactive team, we have around 10 people in total doing data journalism in one form or another. So the interactive team are focused on digital storytelling so yes, charts and graphs, but they also think about telling stories in new ways. So for bigger projects, they are tasked with thinking about the best medium to tell that story. And our team is, if you like, the digital story finding part. So we are the people that find the stories in the first place. And often you won't know when you see one of our stories that it's a data story, because often we don't have charts or graphs or even numbers because what we're doing is using data or databases as a starting point for an investigation. And then we will combine that with more traditional reporting. So that's one way that we, we differ from the interactive team, who also do their own stories from time yeah, to time. But if I ask uh, practically, is your team relied on for, for example, fact checking? I mean, you work with like, the production journalists, but they come to you and say, no, not normally, not usually. Um, that norm actually, that's something that the interactive team might do is think about whether there's a way to illustrate a story um, using data. Uh, but that's not, doesn't, we would of course do it and, and help if we were asked, but that's not the core function of, yeah. of our team. And I, I would also just add to that, that mm. that is something that I actually discourage. Hmm. We, have a, we have a research department at Swedish Television, and if somebody comes up to me and says, can you find me a number for this, or can you fact check this story, it's more of a case for the research department than for us. Hmm. I think it's important to sort of, this is part of educating the newsroom in, we are not the numbers people, yeah. we are the data people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it, that's it, because I'm, I'm just thinking of people I work with. Yeah. would think that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm asking their, their questions for that. Yeah, and then I, I will sometimes say, no, we won't do that. Mm. That is research. And I did it a lot when we started out with The Guardian, when people would come to us with ready-made reports and say, yes. oh, this is a data store. And I would say, no, it's not. A report, any reporter can read a report. Yeah. We can maybe help you interpret it, but that's a different thing. 
Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. And, and that's exactly what I was coming on to is uh, the perception of the team and where we fit into the wider newsroom and what relationship we should have. Unusually, some of you who have been in other sessions will have heard me say that my team sits between both the Times and the Sunday Times, who are rival newspapers. So we have to have a very strict Chinese wall between the two publications. I mean, for us, it's a great privilege because we can work with Sean O'Neill on Oxfam one week and work with the Insight team on doping the next week. So I feel like we're, we're very privileged in that. But I have, since I've taken over, made much more of an effort to move us from this service desk um, or being viewed as a service desk and an add-on and an afterthought to showing that we should be consulted at the very beginning of an investigation. And not just consulted, but you, know, you don't need to come over to us and say, who's the best at Excel? But rather you say, I want to do this. And we have the expertise in the data and what tools and techniques should be used. And they will also have their specialist expertise. And we very much want to encourage the fact that collaboration is absolutely the way forward. But actually, we don't always collaborate. And in fact, now we are working more and more on our own investigation. Yeah. And so, and I've made a couple of notes here, but I think what's quite interesting in this new era that we seem to be in is that we've now got people coming through from journalism programme and their beat is their skill. So my beat is my data skill or my investigative skill, rather than a traditional beat such as health or uh, crime or foreign. So that's unusual and it's working out how these people fit together without being seen as one replacing the other or one is more valuable than another. Um, but that is the beauty of data journalism, is that it covers every beat and every jurisdiction, and that's certainly why I love it. And certainly very early on in my journalism education, particularly here, it was so apparent to me that data was another source, another way in. Whilst everybody else is looking over there, there is so much information out there that if you know how to handle it and filter it, the possibilities are endless for your own exclusives and stories. So that's what really attracts me to it. And so a lot of what I've been focused on is really changing our relationship with the newsroom. And it is going quite well. We will have hopefully our a sort of big investigation that the data team investigation going out. It will look like a traditional news story, but it was absolutely a data-led project. And stories, particularly at the time, and I'm sure at all newspapers, stories are the currency of the newsroom. So I can tell reporters until I'm blue in the face that you can do amazing things if we just do this. It's only when you do it and they see the result and that you'll find people come to you and say, hey, I saw that story. How did you do that? I've long had this other idea. And you find that organically you start to get culture change and people actually start to come to you rather than you always having to go to them. Um, so yes, yeah, so we, we try, I'm trying not to let us be pigeonholed as the numbers people, um, but to show that we are actually trained journalists. Our aim is the same as everybody else's aim. No, I, I, and I do, I and do, I do so uh, if I may give <coughs> one example, I think I have time, don't I? Yeah, yeah. Um, so after the Skripal poisoning, we were asked to help with a story to find out how many members of the House of Lords were on the, on the payroll of the Russian in some way. And they said, well, it's going to be a real manual slog. And you'll often find this. Uh, we, we always say the more repetitive and boring a task is, the more automatable it is. So we love these kind of stories. And they said, we're going to have to go through all of their declarations um, and then work out which companies are Russian or have Russian directors or ultimate owners. And they said, it's going to take us weeks. That's what you would think. But actually, with technology and with web scraping, we can very quickly extract the declarations. And we have new data sets in the form of the ultimate ownership register that have just been released in the last couple of years. We match the two together. I think, Helena, you talked about matching data yeah. sets earlier. 
We matched them together and we just filtered it to which of those ultimate owners were Russian. That led us to eight lords straight away. So we could go back the next day and say, here you are, here's where you start looking. So a story that was anticipated to take weeks uh, took very little time. It was a front page story and we've had a government inquiry. That's fan a fantastic way of showing um, fellow reporters uh, what's possible. And I saw her in the ladies' loo the day it was published and she said, I'm a complete convert. I didn't, I didn't know how the data team could help, but now I really want to work with you again. So, uh, you know, those kind of wins with reporters, I think eventually, I, I'm optimistic and hoping that I can convert all of the naysayers, but uh, yes, so... Um, You're young. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I, what I always say in our newsroom is that, you know, we're at a time of shrinking newsroom resources. And, uh, you know, I'm passionate about making sure my colleagues know that we can use data and technology to still do our job very well, and in fact, better, and produce impactful reporting. Um, so, yeah, so we've talked about the first, kind of thinking of it in terms of a life cycle of a team. We've talked about the first two kind of components, setting up a team, running a team. And, I mean, one of the challenges with running a team as well is continuing a team moving forward how do you grow a team how do you advance how do you advance your skills and that's what i'm just going to talk about for the next five ten minutes and then we'll open up for questions and I, there's definitely things that you both had mentioned that i thought actually yeah, yeah definitely other kind of takes on that or different experiences mm. so i run a small team in the newsroom in the guardian we sit with investigations which is really convenient um, because proximity breeds <laughs> stories um, and my, my, I've only run the team for a year and a half, but it didn't take long for me to realize that given that a lot of us are in organizations where our role is not completely clearly defined in the, in the minds of senior management. So it is really our job to continually redefine it, right? So nobody is going to come to me and tell me to, or ask me to do something that is outside of their scope of understanding of what it is that I know. Very often in our team, we're hamstrung by what people ask us to do because they ask us to do what they already know that we're, we can do, right? So as a manager, my view is how can I get my team to build their skills? How can I get them to think about, not this story that we're doing today, but if I build slow, if I build kind of small building blocks, be it in Python or R or scraping or regular expressions or a bit of statistics, if I'm building that alongside the work that I'm doing day to day, where will I get in six months? Where will I get in a year? Where will I get in two years? Because that's how we all learned as well. When you look back, sometimes you think, God, I teach R, that's quite incredible because I was not really that very good at it. But I teach it now, right? And I, I run a team and I use it day to day. And you realize in retrospect that it's kind of small building blocks and small stories that, that get you wins. So I'm, I tell my reporters as well when we have kind of every, every quarter we have a meeting about what have we done in the past quarter, what was successful and what would we like to do. And the reason why this is really important is because we're in newsrooms where people don't necessarily understand everything that we do. And so if we want to develop our skills, we need to be thinking about that ourselves so we need to be the ones kind of pushing it ahead because a lot of the reporters don't really know what scraping is don't really know what regular expressions are or don't really know how they might apply machine learning in their daily reporting or in the kind of data projects so that's really our jobs to be looking ahead and thinking how can we do that and how can we that's that's the other challenge because quite often training budgets are hard to fight for so for the kind of projects that we do on my team, they can, they can scale from two, three days to two, three months to six months to something that's running in the background over the, the course of a year. And really when you kind of sit back and look at how, much, how many hours do you have in a day? How many, hour, how many days do you have in a week? And what could you be doing within that time? Quite often there are times in between stories where you're, you're looking for something else, you're casting around for something else, or you're you've got, there's, there's space for developing skills. And so I, in kind of conversations about how we're going to grow our skills within the team, I do encourage people to think about what is it that they, what stories do they want to be telling in the next six months or the next year, and to be working on those small skills on the side themselves. 
The best example I have of this where we had a, like a recent breakthrough was Neve McIntyre, who was training with me this morning, who's on my team, um, has just recently been learning how to scrape um, and working in Python and web scraper. And she did a project where she went through Amazon um, wish lists. So she went through all the Amazon wish lists for schools, primary schools, secondary schools, and looked at what kind of things schools were looking for and what kind of things they were crowdsourcing from parents, relatives, for funds, to, to fund basic essential school needs, educational needs. Um, and she did that with scraping. And that was something that she had been kind of building up on the side, going to things like hacks hackers, going to journal, journal coders, <laughs> and building up skills over time. And then the only way to really kind of prove the worth of the skills is to apply them to a story. So in that time, she was kind of casting around thinking, what are the things I can scrape? And <laughs> what's interesting on those sites? And let me build up that way. So sometimes it's, it's not a matter of having a massive project idea and finding the skills to suit. Sometimes it's about building up the key skill that you want to develop and finding a story that will fit into that, that world. So it's, all, it's always about thinking about where am I going next, what's coming up next, and how can I get there, which is a real challenge when, there's a new, when you're in a newsroom that doesn't have a big training budget. One of the other ways that I encourage my reporters to do this is by asking them to look at what's happening in other fields. So when we look at in fields like tech or where technology is also being applied, it's no different to what's happening in newsrooms. So I have colleagues who work in finance or law, and they're also kind of in a, in a world where so many companies are changing and trying to incorporate data skills into what are very traditional reporting methods, right? Very traditional reporting methods, be it through finance or, or legal professions. And they're coming up against the same kind of challenges that we are. So I'm always interested in what people are doing in fields that are kin, if they're not, although they're not journalism. It's always interesting to look at what other organizations are building or what they're thinking about what comes next. The other ways, I guess, of training are conferences. A lot of my learning has come from conferences, from building up networks, from meeting people and training alongside them, or training as a kind of, I guess, as a, as a mentee, being menteed and having a mentor relationship with people through conferences is massively useful for kind of building your own skills and seeing what's coming up. And then training within the newsroom, I think we talked about that as yeah. well. Training within the newsroom is, is really useful, but you can get into a, a kind of cycle where you're constantly training the same thing. Right? You're kind yeah. of teaching people the same skills. You're, you're, it feels like you're, you should be preaching to the converted, but very often you're really asserting what it is that you do time and time again. And that can be really challenging. And I can find it quite wearing, I think. I'd imagine you guys feel the yeah. same, right? Yeah. So you're training, so you're trying to advance the skills of the newsroom, although it's also yeah. a little bit of self-advertorial. Yes. Mm. So you find them and they come to you. But on occasion, you do get a couple of reporters. You get a handful of reporters who already have ideas who will advance the field within the newsroom itself. So kind of building reporters, or as we called it for a while, gathering scalps. We were, trying, <laughs> we were joking about which reporters had been converted within the newsroom. Yeah. And sometimes we might have a secret project where it's like, I'm going to get that person to work with me. But by the end of the year, yeah. I'm going to have worked on a story with that person because they've got really good ideas and really interesting stories. They just don't know what my skills could do for their stories.